Greetings, nerds. Right now, as you take in the momentousness of this YouTube keynote, you may be wondering, who is this generic ass white man? Well, my name is Sydney Skybetter, and I'm a professor at Brown University, which is an Ivy League university. So like, yeah, your, your mileage may vary. Before going any further, I have to first thank and then apologize mostly apologize to Doug, Joanna, and the entire production team at the Arts Entrepreneurship and Innovation Lab. These sorts of virtual events are a total cluster f Total cluster f this show? Uh, they're, really, they're really hard to produce. And you all are the best. I wanna thank you also, the viewer, for clicking a link on the internet which given the last few weeks may actually be both the minimum of what was required and the most that could be brought to bear. So like a uh, good on you. And in all honesty, I hope this keynote address finds you well. I hope this keynote finds you well and planning to start like seven podcasts. I hope this keynote finds you with opinions on the media reflective of the moment, such as Reservation Dogs, which is an incisive portrait of indigeneity, loss, and hope or the latest Matrix movie, which is bad when watched straight, but good when watched gay. I'm not so sure about the latest Top Gun movie though. I mean, it looks rad, but also maybe bad? My, my dad let me see the original Top Gun when I was a toddler, and it traumatized me into pursuing a Russian literature degree without the benefit of speaking Russian. I hope this finds you not arguing on the internet that the next James Bond should be black because apparently that's something people on the internet have been doing. Because look, I, I get it, Idris Elba is very, very handsome, but maybe having a black psychologically unhinged murderer representing a down and out colonial superpower that tried to take over Africa isn't part of the long arc towards justice the internet seems to think it is. I hope this finds you ready to meet the trials of your time. I hope this finds you capable of distinguishing between the twin columns of our era irony, and racism, because there's a whole lot of human 4chans out there spouting a lot of shit, like racist diaper geysers up the back of representative democracy. Is this the sort of thing I'm supposed to be talking about? I mean, I, I, I honestly have no idea how to make a YouTube keynote interesting. The only instructions I got were to talk about the arts and institutional inequity. I, I literally don't know. I mean, so my dad was diagnosed with cancer the other day. It's still very early and he's doing well, actually. He's uh, been getting out of doing dishes by saying he can't do chores. He's too busy battling cancer. It's not funny haha, -ha, but um, still things have been a little disjointed since I hope this finds you with loins girded for the world, which let's face it, is an epidemiological turducken, a fractal infinitude of f it up in this, a stack of turtles that goes all the way down, but the turtles are metaphors for precarity inflation, racial capitalism, surveillance capitalism, late capitalism, neoliberal capitalism, carceral capitalism, and monkeypox. Because apparently we have to deal with monkeypox now too. How to note good comma inspirational comma jokes everything being terrible. How are you? Like, like really, how are you? You doing okay? You doing well? You hanging in there? Because you seem to have your act together. And if you're not doing okay, then I am f***ed. I hope this finds your artistic and intellectual talents your brain sluices and your privilege, ready to get out the vote, ready to fight for your rights, ready to march, ready to organize, ready to do the work required to meet the trials of your time, ready to blow shit up with love and then do a slow, unfazed walk towards the camera like Idris Elba's character Stacker Pentecost in the kaiju classic Pacific Rim. When I was 12 and going away to art school for the first time, uh, my dad, 
gave me a CD with Barbara's Adagio for strings on it. He said it was one of his favorite pieces of music. I think he heard it while watching the film Platoon and said something about how it was played at JFK's funeral. Uh, but that's not quite right. Uh, Jackie O arranged for the National Symphony to play the piece after he died. It was one of JFK's favorites, but for an empty concert hall. Now, I remember listening to that piece on repeat for months on my busted ass CD player, The Thickness of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And every time the music crescendoed off a cliff into silence, I welled up. And it wasn't the triple Lutz fortissimo crescendo. It was the crushing, palpable, reverberant absence of a silence after that gave me a glimpse into dad's emotional life, which as a preteen, I had no particular aperture into. I was thinking of this. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, one second. Um, uh, hello. Sorry. One second. Um, no, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Um, um, no pineapple. Just on on the left side. Stuffed crust is that's great. Stuffed crust. Speaking of apertures, I'm going to be etymology guy for a second. Did you know that the Latin root of the word entrepreneurship is entra, meaning roughly to swim out? Not just to swim, but to swim out, to some out there, uh, beyond, past the linemen of the known. It's, it's a utopian kernel that acknowledges a present state, but gestures to a future one. So I hope this finds you creative entrepreneurs seriously emphasizing the entra in entrepreneurial and maybe leaning out from the douchebag Silicon Valley late capitalist dumpster fire sense of the word. Okay, wait, wait, I'm, I'm on a roll. So since I'm going to be Ivy League Webster's Dictionary defines etymology douchebag, douchebag? Okay, Ivy League etymology person for a second. Let's talk technology. So the Latin root of technology is techne, which is conventionally translated as craft, but I've also seen it translated as roughly to make an opening. Technology, technology, then is the branch of knowledge dedicated to making openings, catalyzing possibility. I prefer this understanding of the word to like technology as expensive object designed for planned obsolescence on the basis of a fucked up global supply chain. I mean, go back a few thousand years and technology is about expanding individual and collective means. There's a politics to that word that's been totally lost that I want to hold on to, that I need to hold on to. I don't understand the use in pretending I'm okay or that we're okay or that any of this is okay. My doctor literally diagnosed me with something called computer neck the other day, and my five-year-old woke up screaming last night because her throat hurt, and she was afraid she had COVID, and that if she went back to sleep, she'd never wake up again. Like, how can I think about artistic excellence or whatever when the state of Rhode Island has shut down all its testing facilities and my kid is sick? Is that just how this works now? Is there anybody out there that's unscathed? And if so, do you have a podcast? You all need to read Anna Watkins Fisher, The Play in the System. Now, it's a manual for life right now. Fisher's like, look, we can't just turn off capitalism. We can't divorce ourselves from our implication in military industrial research or hegemonic technologies. Our protests and resistance are always already co-opted by that which we seek to dismantle. That's just the weather these days. But if we're already implicated, what can we do with that implication? How can those of us who hold structural and situational power like me, but more importantly, like you, artists, managers, administrators, how can you wield your privilege to redirect attention, cash, healthcare, access to abortions and power to those who are made to fall out of the system? The play in the system is infuriating to read because I so badly want a surgical option for surveillance capitalism, but maybe what it means to do the work right now is to do what we can, not what we want. After all, producing, to paraphrase Renciere, is the art of the possible. F this is depressing. Here at Brown, I teach my students how to think about bodies in relation to computation and about just how easy it is to habitually see ourselves like the computers see us, 
like data points, motion, captured, the pattern of life, not the life itself. Now, notionally, I teach choreo robotics, but really, I teach what it means to be fleshily embodied in a world built increasingly for machines. The best part about the play in the system is its proposal of a theory of parasitism, which, gross, but stick with me. It's all about what it takes to live within a hostile system, like the university, like racial capitalism, like the not-for-profit sector, systems that will absolutely annihilate you if you don't appear to follow the rules. But some of the rules can be bent, others can be broken. The play in the system suggests that to dismantle the matrix, you don't and can't go full Neo Ted Kaczynski and unplug from the grid and just blow shit up, right? It's not possible. And since you can't escape it, you have to sit with your tiny dole of power, occupying your slice of positional privilege and wait for any narrow aperture through which you can redirect resources to those the matrix intends not to let survive. In this context, if you're actually doing super great right now, you're either not paying attention or are sociopathically disinterested in the nature of the world. Because wellness is not the same as care. Wellness is privilege unconscious of itself. I don't know how to be well right now. And no $20 virtual Peloton hot stone yoga class is going to give your lower lumbar spine sufficient forward flexion to fight the fucking power. Write that down, write that down. It's because of my dad, because of the barber, that I learned how formal construction permits certain affects. I became a choreographer because of you, dad. Your dorky love of barber and Chicago and the Beatles and hell, Star Wars and Top Gun taught me about nostalgia and how compositional form creates an opening for people to feel. Now, at the age of 16, I decided to become a choreographer because I wanted to make people cry. The idea was that I would choreograph my dancers' movements through space and time with such brilliant, even mystical, formal construction that my audiences couldn't help but feel the angsty, teenagery crap that I felt at the time. This is, I should acknowledge, a pretty shitty approach to art making that you know didn't consider consent or power or privilege. Years later though, I started doing choreographic research into emerging technologies when I realized that architecting platforms to coerce people into having feelings without their consent and subliminally nudging them into doing things without rational choice making, that's literally Facebook's business model. That's literally how Google works. That's literally how online marketing is designed to function. These platforms succeed in so much as they separate our bodies from our agency. We founded the Center for Research on Choreographic Interfaces here at Brown to use artistic practices to further our understanding of how computational systems like robots, like artificial intelligences, like surveillance systems affect our bodies. We try to understand how our bodies are compelled to perform for the technologies we use. Any conversation about design or technology should start with a consideration of bodies. We're almost, we're, we're like almost done, right? To be alive right now is to be a contestant on a gong show of a thousand calamities. I literally cannot remember all of the things I'm terrified of. Ebola, killer bees, inflation, must be Tuesday. Heat dome, Fukushima, Terminators, nothing will keep me from my Pilates class. Starving polar bears, uh, the police, um, Al Gore on a scissor lift, uh, degradation of bodily autonomy, um, uh, avocados getting more expensive. Um, this is the point of the play in the system. Non-participation isn't an option. You can't not use the internet. You can't not be tracked by Google. You can't not need money. You don't have a choice but to participate. Your implication and co-optation are guaranteed. But maybe the platform capitalist umbelesis that governs your world also makes resistance possible. To paraphrase spoilers from such films as The Babadook, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Home Alone, maybe it's not so much that you're stuck with them as they're stuck with you. So I ask each of the four people who actually watched to the end of this keynote, hi dad, hi mom, I love you. I hope 
This finds you making and holding space for others and dedicating yourself to envisioning, enacting, and swimming out towards worlds other than the one we currently inhabit. And not other worlds like Mars, thank you, Elon Musk. It's a metaphor, dude. Mars can't save us, you Olympic asshole. I'm talking about a more just world here and now on this non-metaphorical planet. I hope you're reading up on your Octavia Butler, your Simone Brown, your Ruha Benjamin, and your Sasha Costanza Shock. Because what comes next in this Fakakta country is no secret. And because I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. I sincerely hope you're mad too, and ready to do something about it. Well?